So this pops up in my Twitter feed. Science doesn't deny God, it's its greatest advocate. And I'm like, uh, no, uh, seriously, just no. You literally know nothing about the history of mankind or the universe. Look, science is about building models with predictive capability about reality. God is simply a label for something you don't understand. It has zero predictive capability. Zero. However, it does kind of explain everything you don't understand. Like, why does the sun rise? God. Why do I have five toes? God. Why do my eyes not see radio waves? God. What's that rumbling pillar of smoke and fire coming out of the top of that mountain? God. Why does the earth spin this way? God. What's that voice inside my head telling me I should kill Isaac? God. Why is the speed of light faster than the speed of sound? God. Where did the universe come from? God. Now, the next obvious question for the uh, inquisitively minded out there might be, which God? And what sort of silly thing do I have to put on my head to properly communicate with him? But you get the point. Something that explains everything really isn't that much use compared to something that can predict things. Now, obviously, if you were back in the uh, people who invented the God of the Bible and you were being honest, the answer to all of these questions would have been, I don't know. However, at some point, someone got tired of their annoying kids asking annoying questions and just substituted in because a big, ultra-powerful, invisible sky daddy did it all and made it all while no one was looking and decided that the best way his superhuman interpersonal skills could handle this was to vanish and leave absolutely no trace of himself. Oh, and plus, he isn't like people asking a lot of questions and won't be tested to prove that he actually exists. Or, you know, there were some Bronze Age folks worried about this <laughs> volcano erupting nearby. And one of their numbers worked out that if he claimed that it was his super powerful friend on top of the, on top of the mountain there, he could influence people and become their leader. You know, just like Moses in the Bible. Nobody corrects it, right? There's no movement where everybody says, oh yeah, remember how we were, we were, uh, we were inhaling that smoke for 30, 40, 50 years. We, we now have to exhale it. It's all wrong. And the trick hasn't exactly gotten old with time. Hell, even with the early Americans colonizing uh, America, what do you know? Joseph Smith, guided by uh, angels, find some plates that no one else could see or read. Everybody just sucks it up. Like, that's it, you know? It's like flies to sugar water. There's nothing else. We're just going to take that in. And he seems smart. He's wearing a turtleneck. So, you know, obviously, this, this is it. And they tell him that he's the chosen one and has to lead his people and have wives. Lots and lots of wives. Seriously, I don't know why people say that science is the best proof of God. He shows up all the time and tells them what to do and uh, how many wives they should have. If you are a person of faith, you have no doubt that it's God's will that we communicate the good news, that we communicate truth. Those things are important. And apparently... God came down and entered this guy's thoughts. That is, God messed with the neurochemistry of his brain and told him to do stuff. I am a generalist. God called me to be a generalist. Yes, God told uh, Eric Metaxas here to be a generalist. I mean, it's a bit of a come down. It wasn't like, uh, you know, with uh, Abraham where he says, I want you to kill your son or... What with that Joseph Smith where he wants him to have lots of wives? Now with Eric, he wants him to be a generalist. Sure, if you hear voices in your head, what else could it be other than God? 
I mean, if only there were some test for working out if people were just sort of uh, thinking to themselves or whether they were actually communicating with some ultra powerful sky daddy. Even though God knows everything, he's also a generalist. What does it mean to be a generalist? It means to want to communicate. Well, what do you know? There actually is. You see, an ultra powerful sky daddy who made the universe would know everything. Yes, that's right. If you prayed to God, sometimes you would get the answers for your exams. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together and come into agreement in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Where two or more are gathered, there you'll be in the midst of us, and anything we agree upon is touching, you will surely do. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name, we decree and declare that they are protected while at school. Father, we declare that the listener is the head and not the tail in school. We declare that they are blessed. Hallelujah. Lord, we ask you to please give them wisdom for their exams. We ask you to give them knowledge for their exams. We also ask you to give them understanding for everything they are to learn in school and be tested on. And naturally, the reason we don't ban praying in exams as a form of cheating is because it doesn't work. But hey, what about praying for something that's not in your self-interest? How about praying for, say, for instance, the knowledge to end childhood cancer? Why not pray to your God for that? Oh, yes, that's right, because it doesn't work. Yes, God will quite happily turn up and tell someone to be a generalist. He will personally communicate with him to do what he was thinking about doing anyway but won't, say, for instance, communicate how this guy might, say, for instance, cure childhood cancer. And at that point, the excuses pour forward. The one thing that never actually comes forward is a piece of information that was not known beforehand. No wonder they're reduced to making arguments like this. And I kid you not, this is actually in the description of their video. The latest science says we shouldn't be here. Pretty sure it doesn't. It says that the chances life exists is less than zero. <laughs> less than zero. Wow. Where did you learn your mathematics? By praying to God for knowledge of mathematics. But Eric doesn't need to sell himself with actual evidence of God's existence because he's got miracles. When I realize that, I realize that there's such thing as miracles. God does miracles. And I have actually experienced a few genuine miracles. I don't mean like a blessing. I mean like a miracle where you go, wow, that is insane. That is insane. God is real. That just happened. Now, it turns out Eric's actually seen lots of miracles. But the one that he waxes on the most about in his talk goes on for about 20 minutes before coming to the conclusion that he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal that went viral. Uh, I, I want to talk to you less about the miracle uh, of the universe than the miracle of um, a Wall Street Journal op-ed that I wrote. It was funny because Tim Keller, who's the pastor, who was the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian in, in New York City, kind of a big deal. I decide to write this piece. So I write an op-ed, is science leading us to God? And I think... Who's going to publish something like this? Maybe, you know, foxnews.com. Uh, his article had reached 15,000 Facebook shares. My daughter, every now and again, tells me like, well, it's up to 7,000 Facebook shares. By the time we were settled into our hotel in Vermont, it was not just passing Tim Keller's 15,000 Facebook shares. No joke, folks. It went over the course of the next couple of weeks, quote unquote viral, it went to well over 300,000 Facebook shares. Yes, why bother with whose second rate miracles like amputees regrowing limbs? You know, the miracles that God doesn't seem to be able to perform when you can have the miracle, the miracle of the 15,000 Facebook shares. Yes, this was the miracle, the miracle of the article with a clickbait title going viral. I wrote a piece with the title, uh, Is Science Leading Us to God? I mean like a miracle where you go, wow, that is insane. That is insane. God is real. That just happened. They changed the title to Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God. 
I mean, it's not like in the same talk, he actually goes on about how the, the, the mainstream media does things for clicks. Because the mainstream media, they're interested in selling papers, they're interested in sleeping with their girlfriends, they're interested in whatever they're interested in. So one of the things that I discovered uh, is that God is real and that he's active today. He certainly is, and working his miracles through the power of Facebook shares. However, it seems like this monkey picture can blow your God out of the water when it comes to miracles on Facebook. Hell, it even looks like hillbilly thunderstruck can eclipse God, let alone plant and soil hacks, which laughs at your God's influence on Facebook with impunity. In fact, you want to feel empowered. Why not do something that God can't do? You know, like say for instance, leave a like on this video, or even better, share it with your friends. It's up to 7,000 Facebook shares. You know, because it'd be funny. But I've got even worse news than that for you, Eric. You see, your video on the miracle of the universe got some 40,000 views in the first four months. This video will probably get that many in the first four hours. What does that tell you about your God's miracle power? I know, I know, he was probably tired from the miracle of the 15,000 Facebook likes or shares or, or whatever. In all these other areas, I could talk about biblical archaeology. It's the same concept, right? Every year that passes, we discover more and more and more and more evidence for the Bible. Let's cut to this guy's main argument, which is a universe which is almost completely devoid of life, must therefore be fine-tuned for life. At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? No, science suggests that looking at a universe which is overwhelmingly hostile to life and saying, you know, that's fine-tuned for life is kind of delusional. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? Inconceivable odds? What the hell are you on about? Do you have any clue about the universe in which you live? Let's start at the uh, start of the universe some 15 billion years ago. As some giant cloud of is bathed into the universe, a giant cloud of hydrogen and helium. Boom, there you go, clearly designed for life. Uh, sorry, what's that? This universe that was uh, created for life has no life in it. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions... Well, I'm sure it'll be along any minute now, maybe in the next seven days or so, you know, because this was fine-tuned for life. And no, after seven days, nothing. Well, let's try after a year. No, it's still just a giant cloud of hydrogen and helium. How about after a, another year? No change. Ten years later, still just a giant cloud of hydrogen and helium. One hundred years later, still a giant lifeless cloud. One thousand years later, is it intelligently designed yet, Dad? No, still just a giant cloud of hydrogen and helium. Ten thousand years later, one hundred thousand years later, still nothing. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? One million years later, while well, this fine-tuned universe is really, really taking its time to create humans to pray to thank some Bronze Age Middle Eastern God for creating this giant cloud of hydrogen and helium. Ten million years later, Put the kettle on, Mum. This might take a while. One hundred million years later, and I've now been watching Game of Thrones so much that I'm beginning to think that the last season was a secret masterpiece. Well, whatever. It's still more interesting than watching the giant lifeless space cloud. Then finally, hold on to your hats. Somewhere between 100 million and a billion years ago, 
boom, we have our first stars. The universe is finally doing something. But there's still no life. <laughs> they're, they're just chuntering. These stars are just chuntering away, turning hydrogen into helium and some light. Okay, so now we're on to the billion year time scale. Galaxies start to form, and some of the biggest stars start to fuse helium into heavier nuclei. Yay! Life! Oh no, wait, hang on. No, all that heavy material is locked away in the middle of stars at millions of degrees Celsius in a potential well where it can't escape. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? However, some of those stars at the end of their life go supernova, which blows some of those heavier nuclei into space. Boom, there we go. Adam and Eve, seven... Oh, no, 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 wait. It's just another lifeless space cloud. This goes on for some 10 billion years. And eventually, some stars start to condense in this residual space cloud. And some of the planets start to form out of heavier nuclei. Boom, instantly, life, because it's designed for life. Uh, no. Turns out, almost all of those accreted bodies are at about the temperature of lava. Not really suitable for life. Some of those planets are too close to the star and turn into burned rocks, and others are too far from the star and are basically left in deep freeze. In fact, hell, let's just go out to merely our galaxy. Boom, there it is, our galaxy, the Milky Way, about a quarter of a trillion stars. And so far, we know of only one place that contains intelligent life. Can you tell which one it is? Which part of this? This is just our galaxy. One galaxy out of trillions. Can you see which part of it is uh, designed for life? Anyway, let's cut to the chase. By four billion years ago, all the heavy stuff on this molten ball has mostly sunk to the core. Most of the light stuff like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen have mostly made their way to the surface. And the surface is cold enough that you're getting things like liquid water on the surface. And there's some sort of chemistry that starts to go on here. And you get surfactants that form things like micelles and vesicles. And some of the chemistry in those vesicles starts to happen more frequently than in others. And this is maybe the early sort of thing that you might call life. Hallelujah! Designed for a single-celled organism. And so it goes on for the next year, just a single-celled organism. And for the next 10 years, just a single-celled organism. 100 years, just a single-celled organism. 1,000 years, just, just a single-celled organism. Some time later. 100 million years later. Now, just a single-celled organism. A billion years. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? No, just a single-celled organism. Then finally, about four billion years after these first single-celled organisms came along, there's kind of a bit of a change in the atmosphere. All these things have, have started creating oxygen. And boom, this is one of the stepping stones that you need for multicellular life. Yay, the sea sponge is born. Finally, multicellular life has come along. Uh, no, not quite, because that can't do any thinking. So one of the cells that evolves in these multicellular organisms is the neuron, which allows things to respond to their environment. And working out things about the environment, it turns out, is a survival characteristic. And boom, the brain is born. So just to rapidly tie up this story, some 50,000 years ago, the rise of modern humans. 5,000 years ago, the rise of civilization. 500 years ago, the discovery of science. Some 50 years ago, we discovered just how big and empty the universe is. Yeah, for a mere 50 years out of 15 billion, we have known how big and empty the universe is. Some five years ago, the smartphone is invented. Some five minutes ago, you started watching this video about this guy who knows how big and empty the universe is, and he's saying with a straight face that it's actually designed for life. 
Yeah, this isn't designed for life. This is a giant death void. Hell, if you look at just our planet, it's been here for some five or so billion years. And it's only for the last 50 or so we've had a sensible idea of how it all works. That is, for one hundred millionth of our planet's existence, it's had intelligent life on it. And that's peanuts. I once did the volume calculations for the volume fraction of our galaxy that is life-sustaining. That if I were to teleport you randomly into our galaxy, what are your chances of surviving? And it's something like 1 in 10 to the power of 50, which is like buying 10 winning lottery tickets in a row. And if you stroll out to the universe, it becomes absolutely comical. I mean, pictures like this make the universe look like a busy, full place. But all of this is way too faint to be seen with human eyes. The night sky is one of the brightest places in the entire universe, inside one of those galaxies. And the vast majority of the universe is just a vast emptiness between galaxies. If you were to be teleported randomly to some place in the universe, this is what you would normally see. And no, that's not a blank screen there. That's what most of the universe looks like. Look, calling a giant death void designed for life because not every single person who goes into it dies instantly is kind of like saying, look, not everyone who jumps out of a plane without a parachute dies when they hit the ground. Therefore, the Earth was designed to save people who jump out of planes without parachutes. You know, the whole fine-tuned universe argument might hold a little more water if your chances of survival on being randomly teleported into it were at least comparable to a red shirt on Star Trek. I want to put it out there. So I'm going to write a couple of chapters in the Miracle Book about the fine-tuned universe. And believe it or not, I've just scratched the surface with this guy who seems to be legitimately just a minion of the Discover Institute. You know, those were the people who decided that intelligent design, the... Uh, Low energy relabeling of creationism is somehow science and is ready for another crack at being taught to kids in schools. So let me know what you think. Would you like to see more like this? Make sure to subscribe such that you don't miss out on new content. And hell, if you really want to support this channel, you can do it directly through Patreon or visiting my Amazon store below, which is chock full of science goodies that'll let you see what the real universe is like.